Good morning. Hi, uh, and thank you so much for visiting us here at New America. New America is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy institute that invests in new thinkers and new ideas to address the next generation of challenges for the United States. I'm Kevin Bankston. I'm the policy director of New America's tech policy and tech development wing, the Open Technology Institute, which seeks to foster a more open society through more open technologies. That mission includes working to ensure that new technologies help to empower communities and to reduce rather than enhance the inequities in our society. As such, we at OTI are very proud to be signatories to the subject of today's discussion, the civil rights principles for an era of big data. Too often, discussions about privacy have failed to address the issues of justice and equity and have failed to include the voices of the civil rights community. These principles, which seek to remedy that failure and inject new voices into the privacy debate, come at a particularly critical juncture, just as the White House has initiated a comprehensive review of the way that big data will affect how we live and work, our relationship with the government, uh, and the question of how to maximize the innovation and opportunity that comes from this data uh, and minimize the risk to privacy that comes from this data. We think that consideration of civil rights must be a core component of this review. Indeed, I and a number of the folks on the panel today will be attending a White House convened workshop in New York on the ethics of big data on Monday to promote the principles we're going to be talking about today. Uh, that includes Sita Pena Gangadaran, uh, our senior research fellow who's long been focused of issues of, on issues of digital inclusion, data profiling, and social justice. Sita is going to be moderating today's panel, and so I'm going to turn things over to her. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, and good morning and welcome, everyone. As somebody who spent a lot of time in the field working with and in communities, especially communities of color, I encounter many, many people who, like me, are excited about harnessing digital technology to improve our lives. We are excited about the power of digital technologies to help us achieve personal and collective goals. But there's power in digital technologies, power that can be inhibiting, power that can be limiting, and a power that reflects choices and values about um, by those who design, deploy, and disseminate our digital tools. However that power affects us, I think most of us would agree that no one wants to see digital technologies promote unfairness unaccountability, and inequity. That is especially salient for members of underserved communities who, for generations, have had to deal with unfair data collection and analytical practices. And that's why we're here today. This morning, I'm joined by five individuals with whom I've had the privilege of working in the past year, or for more than a year now, uh, on, among other things, uh, civil rights principles for an era of big data. We aim to have a frank and open conversation about big data, not only in the context of privacy, but equity. Let me introduce our panelists briefly. All the way to your left, we're joined by Corrine Yu, Senior Counsel at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Hazine Ashby, Legislative Director at the National Urban League. Chris Calabrese, Legislative Director, or sorry, Legislative Counsel at the ACLU. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Lagria, Senior Staff Attorney at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, and we do hope that we'll be joined by Rashad Robinson, Executive Director of Color of Change shortly. I imagine he's um, stuck in traffic because I understand it was quite difficult this morning. Our panelists here represent vast social networks of citizens and consumers across the United States who provide thousands of data points in their daily digital interactions. Given how grounded all of you are in your communities, I anticipate that you will have many stories to share uh, that go beyond the purely legal or technical discussions on predictive analytics. And on that note, 
We do want this to be a lively and interactive dialogue, so I'm relying on you, our panelists, to feed off of one another, um, to prompt one another, and I'll try and, inter and interject with questions um, from myself and also from the audience, both, both of uh, those that are here uh, with us in Washington, D.C., as well as those who are tuning in by webcast. And we'll leave a greater chunk of time towards the end to field the audience's questions. Please do join us at hashtag data justice and post your questions there so we can follow along. So, Kareem, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that you can get us started. Um, and tell us, how did these civil rights principles arise? Who is this group of signatories, and uh, how did we get to this point? So I can only do that if I can figure out the technology of the mic. Is the mic on? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so you can hear me. Great. And here, and do you want to introduce Brashad, who's, <laughs> who's coming down the hall? Um, so thank you, Sita, and, and um, I'm delighted to be on this panel, um, and it's and delighted to be sitting here with all my colleagues and friends, so I think we're going to have a great discussion today. I just wanted to note that there are a number of important milestones that we're going to be commemorating this year or ha have already begun to commemorate. Um, it's the 50th anniversary of the War on Poverty and of the creation of the Great Society and of the Civil Rights Act, 1964. It also happens to be the 25th anniversary of the World Wide Web. So it's a very good time, I think, to look at the intersection of civil rights and online privacy, and that's what we're gonna be doing today. Um, now these are not the kind of anniversaries you celebrate with flowers and candy. They are t anniversaries where we as- Celebrate with panels? Yes, we do. <laughs> and talking heads, <laughs> exactly. Um, we talk a lot about them, and we look back and see how much progress we've made, and we look ahead to see how much yet is to be done. And you know, maybe 50 years from now, you know, when we've got our trackers in our heads at that point, you know, we're going to be looking back at this time and we're going to think um, what was happening there. Um, now civil rights groups have been thinking about issues of data and technology and privacy for a very long time. Um, the collection of data, such as through the decennial census, um, is important for a whole host of reasons, for civil rights enforcement, for the implementation of federal programs, for redistricting, um, and it's a top priority for the civil rights community for that reason. Um, technology in the form of television brought the civil rights struggles of the 60s into the homes of uh, Americans across the country so they could see what was happening in the South, and it was a direct cause, a direct reason why we have a Voting Rights Act now. And for privacy issues, well, these are issues that the community has been concerned about for a long time because of the long history of surveillance being used against these communities. So um, we looked at today's moment and including the White House review of big data as a great time to bring groups together to think about these issues and determine whether there's common ground. And as you heard two weeks ago, a coalition of civil rights and media justice organizations came together to endorse the civil rights principles in an era of big data. And this is a historic step for many of the groups who um, came to the table to put forth these principles, um, a first step into the conversation about big data. And it's just the beginning, and we're looking forward to seeing what happens next. Now, our expertise is in civil and human rights. Um, and we want to bring that expertise to the table. And I appreciate Kevin's comments about how um, these voices are not often heard as part of the debate. Our intuition was that there were broader issues that are in play than issues of what kind of algorithm we're going to be creating. Not that algorithms aren't important. Um, if I understood them, I would think they were even more important. <laughs> but, but I do know civil rights. We all know civil rights. And whether we use the language of uh, big data or privacy or civil rights, um, the questions are the same. So. We're talking about criminal justice. We're talking about jobs. We're talking about financial inclusion. Um, we're talking about what kind of society we want to be in, um, whether concerns of equal opportunity and equal justice and fairness are going to be part um, of that society, and whether civil rights concerns of bias and discrimination are going to put us all at risk. 
So uh, that is the frame through which we are looking at all of these principles, and that will, um, I think, help guide our discussion today moving forward. Um, I wanted to start with the, the first principle, which is stop high-tech profiling. Um, now, uh, an, one of the major reasons why we wanted to address these issues is because big data has the potential to supercharge discrimination in ways that victims don't even see. And I think this issue of profiling is a great example of that. Um, now, racial profiling refers to the, the practice by law enforcement of targeting individuals not because of their behavior, but because of their personal characteristics. It's unconstitutional, it doesn't work, and civil rights groups oppose it. And yet, it persists. It persists in the context of street-level crime, um, you know, stop and frisk, driving while black or brown, it persists in the context of counterterrorism in the wake of 9-11. It persists in the context of immigration enforcement. And now it's cheap because of technology. So we are seeing surveillance, uh, surveillance and profiling, high-tech profiling done in a way that it's never been done before. Um, and that is a cause for concern. Um, so we have license plate readers who can record the cars that are parked at certain mosques and then can track them thereafter. We have a debate that's still unfolding. We don't know where it's going to end up. We hope that our principles can inform that debate. So um, I think my own view is that you have a flawed practice when it comes to profiling. Why are, why are we going to put it on steroids and make it even worse? And so our first principle, stop high-tech profiling, is something that um, I think folks in the civil rights community are very concerned about and um, are pleased to have discussions with those who can develop policy. Um, I know that uh, my colleagues on, at the table um, might have some additional comments that they want to say about the profiling issue, so I mean, we just open it up? No, I was just going to say, I mean, it's also, it's interesting that one of the things technology sometimes does very well or, or very in a very troubling way is to add a sort of air of impartiality to things. It's like, well, it must be fair. The computer spit it out. Well, you know, garbage in, garbage out is another old programmer saying. And if you put bad data in, you'll get bad data out. So to put a concrete lens on this, right, the Chicago police announced recently that they have what they call a heat list. So 400 people who are most likely to be involved in violent crime in, in Chicago. Now, it, it's not entirely clear what you have to do to be on the heat list, but it is clear that it doesn't it's not just sort of your criminal background in the past. It's not that you've been arrested for us. It's not that you've been convicted of assault, for example. It has to do with things like your associations and, you know, police interactions that may not have anything to do with you know, being arrested or convicted for anything. So, you know, it's worth asking who are the police targeting? You know, what, what, what criteria are they using to make that target? How do you end up on the heat list? And if you are on the heat list, by the way, the police may come to your door and say, we're watching you, right? You're, we're keeping an eye on you. Well, it's been my experience that it's a really good predictor of whether somebody's going to be arrested for a crime is whether the police are watching them. You know, because if you watch me all the time, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you may find me doing something wrong. I mean, it's not me because I never do anything wrong, but other people <laughs> do things wrong. And if you, but so, you know, the focus <laughs> itself causes, you know, causes potential discrimination. So, you know, the fact that the, the computer algorithm spit it out maybe gives it a gloss of being fair or reasonable, but that doesn't make it more so, and it potentially is relying on all the same biases and problems that the old data has just kind of been cleaned up by, a, by an algorithm. So that's, you know, that's one, and, and I think we can continue to, to elaborate on those. So on that point of fairness, mm -hmm. um, because I think that's going to be a question that comes up for all of us here on this panel. Um, I think that extends to some of the discussion that we've ha been having around fairness in automated computer decisions. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, Hazine, if you can um, take us down that route and explain um, what's at stake. 
Of course. So, and I want to back up for one second too and say that fairness is what brought the Urban League and I think the other like four legacy civil rights organizations to the table to these to uh, to looking at these at um, at these issues and I don't want to conflate the two so I want to make sure that everybody understands that we are talking both about surveillance and data brokerage so it, there's the government aspect to it and there's a commercial side to it um, and it's because of that fairness like for instance the mission of the Urban League right is to promote um, economic empowerment, self um, self reliance, and parity for African Americans and other underserved um, urban residents. So you get to that you get to that issue of fairness when you start looking one at the surveillance that's happening by the government um, and understanding that there there's a potential for African Americans and Latinos who are overrepresented in our criminal justice system to receive to have a lot for it for that surveillance to have a lot of negative effects um, on our communities of color. But then, if you go over to the commercial side, you also realize that um, we don't know what amount and what types of, of information is being collected about our communities. So I love technology. I think everybody that I work with loves te love technology. I mean, I am, if you would have seen me this morning, realize that I am woefully, woefully directionally challenged. Mm -hmm. So I could not find my way without my MapQuest. I could not find my way without Google Maps. Um, so I rely on those heavily. But because I rely on that heavily, that means that I know that there's information being collected about me that I have no idea about. So I don't know if um, how many people in this room got to read the got got to either attend the Senate hearing in December or read the report that came out from the Senate hearing. Um, one of my one of the quotes that I really wanted to share with everybody because I just thought this is and this one is about commercial. Not even let's, I'm not even going to touch the government side right now. I'll let Chris from ACLU <laughs> really discuss most of that. But um, on the commercial side, one they had a quote from one of the respondents, one of the data brokers, um, and this was the quote. Data, um, the amount of available data has created an unprecedented amount of info about consumers, their attitudes and behaviors, perceptions about brands, what they're buying, and even where they happen to be at the moment the data is captured. I don't know about you guys, but I remember reading 1984 when I was in high school and um, just thinking how unrealistic that was. <laughs> but the fact that it's not unrealistic. That's why you didn't become a privacy lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> the rest exactly. of us like, oh my god, that's the future. <laughs> exactly, well no, that's, it's true. But just thinking about that and looking at it in the frame that we look at everything at the National Urban League being about economic empowerment and jobs. If you look at it that way and you know that there's virtually no federal legislation that protects the information that, that data brokers collect about you because they're not normally considered consumer reports and therefore they don't fall underneath the Fair Credit Reporting Act. That all of this can then be ascribed to you when you're applying for a job, when you're applying for a, a house mortgage, a car loan, when um, you go to the doctor. I mean, because they, they collect, even what is it? I think it's Experian, right? Experian or Equifax has 75, they, re they responded to the to the query from the Senate for this hearing, saying that they had 75,000 different set of data points. That included what shampoo I bought, what when my last OBGYN visit was, where, um, where how many miles I traveled in the last four weeks. Um, it included how far I lived from public transportation. Um, for employment, uh, you could consider like what type of public transportation I take. Now, as a civil rights person, you know that redlining occurs a lot. We know that there's transportation issues. We know that there are th certain things that are ascribed to community of communities of color that aren't ascribed to other communities. So that's I think that's why we're here because we don't know what there's. Um, there's no transparency yet in the system, and we hope that these principles will help create some sort of transparency, so that we can, that so that we can then ed help educate our communities about what's um, what's truly at stake for them. So I I just want to jump in to say if you can all hold in your thought in your heads for a moment what might be the flip side of big data, big data collection, big data analysis for civil rights um, principles. Um, 
kind of thinking of the more positive aspects of data collection. Just hold that in your heads. I think we'll get into a conversation um, later about that. But I want to give Chris the floor to talk about to take us deeper into that hole um, and talk about uh, preserving constitutional principles. Thanks. Yeah. No. This has been such a fun conversation. I mean, I, I the ACLU sits at a great in a really nice place, and we had to do a lot of civil rights work, and we also do a lot of privacy work. So, you know, we've been thinking about these issues for a long time, and I've I've frequently felt like they were sort of flip sides of the same coin. I mean, Hazine is talking about it very clearly. It's like, if I collect lots of information about you, I can make judgments about you, right? I can decide whether you're a desirable or undesirable con consumer. I can rate you. I can give you better or worse services. Like, you know, to me, is that a privacy issue or is that a discrimination issue? I don't know. It's probably both, right? And so to have these conversations is really useful. Um, you know, the when we look at the government side of it, I mean, I think that the, the problems that we've seen are, are to at least certainly to the ACLU, clear and compelling. Um, I mean, the third principle, just to, to note it, is to preserve constitutional principles. This is actually pretty straightforward, right? I mean, the Bill of Rights exists essentially to protect minority viewpoints and minority rights. It's not the only reason the Bill of Rights exists, but it's one of the reasons. So. We've seen a host of discriminatory data uses or surveillance practices that seem, at least from the ACLU's point of view, and I think from many unbiased observers, to be based on discriminatory or faulty premises. For example, when you collect the license plates of everybody who attends a mosque, you know, surely not all those people are guilty, can be guilty of anything. When the FBI engages in a practice of racial mapping, where they go into communities and map the attempt to map the entire community based on sort of broad or vague generalizations about the types of criminal activities they might be engaged in, no, no specific suspicion, just let's get let's map the entire community, let's collect information. To us, that's a very clear example of the intersection of what we're talking about here, and then it plays out in, in really pernicious ways. I mean. I think the government watch list is a great example of this, right? For those, the one of you in the back who's not familiar with the, what a government watch list is, I mean, basically there's lots of different kinds. The government maintains a very large list of potential people to keep an eye on. One of the subsets of the list is the no-fly list. So these are people who are not dangerous enough to arrest, but too dangerous to let fly. So. You know, if I actually had any evidence about your wrongdoing, I would, of course, arrest you. But since I don't, I'm just going to kind of keep you from being able to, for example, visit your dying mother or, you know, work in your job, which requires you to travel. And a surprising number or an unsurprising number of those people are Muslim. You know, again, if they had evidence to arrest those people, they would arrest them. But as it is, they can just put them on a secret list without a real ability to contest or get off. Um, I, I mean, I, I took that. I, we haven't really been talking about particular people, but I'll put a face on this. Uh, Abe Michal is a, uh, has a specialized business in dog training, so it requires him to fly around the country and you know train dogs for particular purposes. Since he was put on the no-fly list, it put a sig significant crimp in his business and his ability to you know, fly around and, and, and work. So, you know, this is a, a Marine veteran. This is someone who served his country, but because of his religion, he's on a no-fly list and can't get off. Incidentally, FBI agents told him they would take him off the list if he agreed to become an informant for the FBI. So you can see how these pernicious practices play in, how they undermine our constitutional values, our things like due process, the ability to contest a determination the government makes about you, and how they're carried out by technology. Their, you know, decisions are made using data analytics. You, you go on a, a you know, a no-fly list, which is promulgated through databases, which are then linked through every time you fly, you've got to, you know, provide your identification. It's so you can be checked against the government no-fly list. So you can see how the technology spreads out. And so, you know, all of this intersection ends up disfavoring particular groups and communities. I've now been talking a long time, Sita. I got fired up, and that's what happens. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of these, and, uh, and I think that we can, 
you know, we can talk about the heat list. We could go ahead and talk about Con Con Intel Pro. We can talk, we talked about racial mapping. I mean, the, the intersection of this is, is a deep and fertile terrain, and I think we're only beginning to explore it. Thanks, Chris. Um, Rishad, if you could uh, walk us through, I think, one component of that problem that Chris and Hazeen and Green have been describing, which has to do with control. So. Great. <coughs> well, first of all, um, thank you all for having this, this um, conversation. I think it's incredibly important and obviously timing, timely given um, the conversations that have been happening. Um, at Color of Change, we've been involved in these issues around sort of technology and our rights on the internet since 2010 when we took a stand as one of the few national civil rights organizations around net neutrality. And in many ways, this, this work is an evolution of that for us. It's an evolution of, of, of us um, trying to find ways and, and using the voices of our members um, to hold big corporations accountable and the government accountable for how we get to have a voice in our democracy. The internet and our ability to go online and access the tools of the day is no longer a luxury. You can't, you can't get an education, you can't apply for a job, you can't deal with certain government programs without sort of being able to access the internet. And so the way in which the, the new economy um, works and, and is driven relies on our ability to be online. And with that um, comes all sorts of um, changes or loopholes to the civil rights protections that have been won, earned, and fought for for the last several decades. And so as we look at the Civil Rights Act, as we look at the fair credit um, rules that have been enshrined and fought for for generations, we have, we're entering a new frontier where um, the rules are not clear and um, the kind of predators, the villains, the heroes, none of the, the, the stories that we oftentimes tell ourselves and the way that we're able to do our work is, is not as clear. And so, you know, let me, let me like talk you through this a little bit and, and I'm going to try to see if we can get involved. You know, how many folks go online sometimes and you get an offer for um, something, you know, a buy one, get one free or something or an offer that if you, you sign up here at this site, they're going to, you know, for me, it's like, you know, you know, you'll, you, you get offers on, on clothing that you would get a little bit cheaper. How many people sometimes enter their information? Does anyone do that? Oh, come on. <laughs> I mean, come on, y'all. Like, 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 let's be clear. We, 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 so we enter our information. Um, in that. And so maybe this room, because we're all here, we've showed up to a conversation around big data at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, we're, not, um, we're not necessarily the kind of target audience for, for, my, um, for my raising of the hands. But you but, don't even have to enter your information. Yeah. I yes. mean, if you walk into a store now, they have card size, like a deck of yes. card size, like sensors, that'll ping how long you've been in the store and yes. what you buy from your credit card data. So you don't even have to enter information and anymore. And that's yes. the part, because it's, it's, what it's what's being collected about you offline and what that ascribes about you. I'm getting there. And so, you know, the, the point is, right, um, you know, in, in, the, in the old era, right, you know, the, the place where you may have, you went into the bank and you gave them your information, they couldn't then use that to sort of deal with predatory lending. Now, sometimes they did and we could catch them, um, but there were rules sort of against that. There were rules against sort of going inside of stores in the past, giving your information, and that being used sort of along the lines of race or other protected classes mm -hmm. to prevent the... Um, to prevent the, the targeting of, of certain communities. What we're entering in sort of this new, this new era is, um, is third party collectors, collectors that sort of are not public facing corporations that sit in between maybe your Walmart or your bank or someplace else and you. And these folks are explicitly collecting data along the lines of race or other sort of identities that are not, are not sort of are, are completely against the rules. And so we've seen, for instance, if you live in certain communities or if you are a certain race and the store decides that the competitor, um, the competitor, the competition, um, that, that store is much further away. They'll offer you a different price 
in that case, a higher price than maybe someone who lives in an area that has a lot of competition. Um, and, what you're gonna, and what you're seeing is, is that data being collected and being offered along the lines of race, explicit list of you know, black folks who are unemployed or, or women, um, you know, um, Latino women um, with children. And those lists now being sold specifically to these corporations and those corporations being able to use this, those businesses being able to use that to then target and make decisions. Mm -hmm. So our ability to be able to participate fairly in this economy, our ability to be able to have, get the same thing at the same place in the same time, which is sort of really the hallmark of, of the work that was done for decades in the civil rights community, is really at jeopardy because um, the new technological age really opens up so many opportunities for folks whose clear agenda is to make money. And that's not to say that that is necessarily a bad thing. But without protections, without sort of a, a look at how do we enshrine a new set of protections to deal with the technological age, how do we sort of advance um, in this time, in this place, a, a new conversation around what are, what are the, the do's and don'ts of, the, of this sort of new information highway, then we are going to sort of be looking you know, at, an, uh, at an economy that increasingly keeps certain folks locked up, lock, locked out, and, and from yeah, a criminal justice, up. and from a criminal justice <laughs> perspective, locked up, and, um, and, and um, increasingly keeps folks sort of in, in the place where they started. And, um, and for us, as an organization that started, um, started in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina with uh, a single email that was sent to about 1,000 folks and has grown over the last eight years into nearly a million members, an organization that works specifically to hold corporations accountable and relies on everyday people being willing to go online and make their voices heard, to be able to, to, to click a button and, and share something on Facebook and to ask other people to join them so that we can move folks up a ladder of engagement to make their voices heard, not just in this new economy, but in this new democracy democracy, our ability to be able to rely on the internet to be able to do what it's supposed to do and to protect our privacy is the clear civil rights issue of our time. And it's something that all of us need to be deeply concerned about and fight for. Thank you. So Rashad has, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you've been talking about how we're locked out. And I'd love for Jason to talk about how we might be included but still excluded um, when we're inside of these databases or inside of these digital systems. Sure. And again, my name is Jason, and I'm with the Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC, and we are a national civil rights group based here in Washington, D.C. And just for those who aren't familiar with the Asian American community, since uh, we often aren't included in many of these discussions, you know, we're 6% of the population. We make up 18 million uh, people in America, some other interesting facts are that 60% of us are actually foreign born, and one out of three of us don't speak English proficiently. And another great thing about the Asian American community, uh, when we look at the tech adoption statistics, is that they lead the way in basically everything. Lead the way in, in cell phones, smartphones, internet adoption, broadband adoption, and the one I'd like to mention the most is we lead the way in video watching online by like <laughs> over an hour averages. Uh, but see, the, the principle I'm going to be talking about is, you know, protecting people from inaccurate data. So, you know, there are huge databases, and sometimes, uh, and more often than sometimes, you know, there's inaccurate data in that system. And you know, a, a great example that's really been a thorn in the side of the Asian American community is the E-Verify system that's run by the government that, you know, gives authorization for people, or checks people's authorization to work in this country. As you know, you, you have to have authorization, especially if you're not a citizen of this country. But what we've seen from the E-Verify program is that you know, naturalized citizens are 30 times more likely than a natural-born citizen to get a false positive in the system. And also, you know, non-legal immigrants, so for example, high-skilled high -skilled immigrants, non-immigrants that come to this country from Asia are 50 times more likely to get a, a you know, false positive. Now, so why does this happen with this database? Uh, parts of it include, you know, the, you know, the database has to get updated. So if you're running through the whole immigration system, it's got to get updated, and that, that's updated daily, but there are delays in that. 
But you know, there's also other parts of the systems that just show you know the inherency of you know errors in the system. So you know the, the database has first and last names, for example. So you know if you look at a Thai last name, really long, something all you need is one letter wrong, or you put an extra space at the end of the of a last name that could get it get your system off. Uh, if you look at last names, you know, like Hispanics, for example, they have multiple last names. Filipinos do because they were once a Spanish colony also. If you look at East Asians, their names are often switched, and, you know, people entering it in the system don't understand that sometimes, and that gets messed up. So that leads to, you know, again, just higher rates of, of, of false positives in this system that, that, that disproportionately affects the Asian American community. And along those lines, also, with this principle is that, you know, you, there needs to be appropriate ways to, you know, uh, access this, infor this inaccurate information and also to address it. Uh, but what we've seen uh, when people are trying to, you know, fix these inaccurate data in the system is that, you know, uh, it takes, like, sometimes over an hour just to even deal with, a, you know, a certain government agency. A lot of times, you know, at least, I think, like, 13 percent of people who are trying to get this fixed spent over $100. Just to get this fixed, sometimes people sometimes people hire lawyers just to get it fixed, and you know f you know for some people a hundred dollars is a lot of money. So again, you know the, these databases are set up you know with these you know totally innocent you know fields, but you know again, given whatever w with a certain population, it, it it leads to this disproportionate impact. So again, as we look, at, you know that's just a government example, but if you're looking at you know, fixing inaccurate information. I mean, who's ever had to like fix their credit report? You know, I'm trying to buy a house right now, and we've had to look at it. Luckily, mine's okay. But we've heard tons of horror stories about people trying to fix their credit. Now, imagine that. You know, we, you know, how how does that look? For example, if we're going to start looking at big data, and and those, you know, people are trying to fix that that data in, in some huge private, you know, completely opaque data system. So. It's just, you know, we haven't gotten to that point yet of how we're going to actually deal with that. But again, it's a good discussion to have. And I was going to say that there's not even the right for you to fix your data. Yeah. And I mean, that's some of the, the credit stuff, there's laws. But, you know, at this point, I'm not sure if there are laws that would specifically no, cover. There are no, there are no laws that specifically cover fixing the data that's being collected about you outside of your consumer report. Mm -hmm. There's, for consumer reports, there are. There are some, because right now it's self-regulated. So if a company wants you, um, wants to give you the opportunity to do so, they can. Um, but then and you can even opt out, but you don't even know who's collecting. You don't even know who the collectors are. So at that point, when you opt out, it's not, you can opt out if you go to find more information about it. But how many people actually have the wherewithal or even the savvy to understand how to do it? Um, and then even when you do opt out, they're not obligated to delete your information, the information that they've collected about you. So there's just a lot that I think as we sit here, that the, one of the main things I want everybody to take away from this panel is it's about education. Mm -hmm. Like we really need to have more, we need to have more information about what's happening. And it's only when you have that information um, can you really push and understand like what's at stake for our communities. Yeah. Um, I think without that information and without the education to our communities, there's um, we we run the risk of in, in in a time when we need economic growth more than ever to not have it. Like, yeah, I was. I mean, I was just to, to make this really concrete, right? People are segmented in ways that they will would be very surprised by and be made very <laughs> uncomfortable by, and and that harm them. I mean. Mm -hmm. You can, if you know somebody is in financial distress, they're three months behind on their mortgage, boy, you can really get in and, and sell them some product that's going to magically save them from all their, the financial harm that they're having right now. Now, that is illegal using, mm -hmm. for example, a credit, a credit report. report. Yeah. But, you know, you can you gather the same information from a data broker, you're skirting that law. And, and this is not, I mean, the, the Senate re Commerce Report that he's in reference is very clear on this. I mean, they're creating lists based on racial and other characteristics, and it's things like struggling seniors, mm -hmm. right? Like, so I know if you're struggling. I know you. I know your particular circumstances, and I can market directly to you, and I can use the knowledge I have about you to figure out how I can take advantage of you. Now, that is a huge power disparity that, you know, it, without access, it's impossible to remedy. I just wanted to underscore something that 
that you said, Sita, in your opening remarks, and that has that Chris, you just alluded to, which is that these are issues that are affecting all of us. So, you know, we've been focusing quite a bit on um, the impact on, on different racial minorities, but um, and the Leadership Conference is a coalition of um, more than 200 organizations that represent basically America. So not only racial and ethnic minorities, but religious minorities, the LGBT community, seniors, young people, women, labor, and you'll see as you look at the principles that the principles um, embrace that, that uh, it's underrepresented populations that need to take this into account. Um, but it's really all Americans who do because of the very fact that, I mean, you just don't know. And, mm -hmm. and I think the, the cross cuts um, are, would be very startling if, if you were able to ascertain them. So I, I just wanted to make sure that folks understand that when we talk about civil rights, we're not talking about this group or that group. Um, these are fundamental American values of equal opportunity, justice, fairness that we're all concerned about. Mm -hmm. I mean, like in the Senate report, they listed out some of the titles that the companies um, gave to different people. And I, I mean, I, as I read it, I was like, I wonder where I would fall in. Because some of them were rural and barely making it, ethnic, second city strugglers, wonder what that one is, <laughs> um, retiring on empty, singles, tough start, young single parents, credit crunched, city families. So I mean, like, it's, it's just interesting, like what does your reading, what, what does your reading habit say for you, right? What does the fact that you go to Whole Foods or automatic or stop going to Whole Foods one month, but you now go to Safeway or Giant say about you? What does the fact that I work at the Urban League say about me, but then go home and read tons of historical romances say about me? Like, you know, I just wanna know, like, I want that right to say, to see that data and to see what, it, what um, um, attributes are being ascribed to me. So I want to jump in here with a question because I promised I would. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to be, I, I want to challenge you to think, so you've, everyone has talked about how data collection can segment us, can harm us, can make, uh, can make inferences about us, um, can make money off of us, and I want to think about ways in which big data collection or data collection and analysis can be used to enhance civil rights. And I'm wondering if you've given any thought to that um, and can talk about that. Yeah, Rashad. Well, I mean, we're about to head into an election cycle. And so anyone who does electoral politics knows how we use voter files, um, knows how we try to think about how to target um, um, uh, various communities and, and move our message uh, to those communities. Um, and so, uh, you know, th that is, um, and, and many of the, the, these questions around um, how folks are reached um, by, um, by either political party, um, um, by, um, by uh, kind of third party organizations during election cycles, on issue campaigns, these are oftentimes we're 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 in the same kind of data frontier here, um, and so um, and uh, these are important questions that we have to be asking ourselves mm -hmm. as we as our communities become more segmented. As as someone who um, specifically works to um, you know empower. Um, black folks, um, and especially as a next generation civil rights organization, I look at what every the mix of what the housing crisis did to um, black communities, and just the fact that communities are becoming more dispersed. Just simply dropping someone off in a black community to knock on doors is not the same as it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And so the idea of how do we reach people and find people and target them with a message to get them to turn out to vote is. We're thinking about the same things as the as what Walmart wants to do when they want you to come into their store to buy um, a product in some ways. Um, that does not mean that there should not be protections, though, and it does not mean that um, we do not need to push back and and enshrine protections that are going to ensure that our our privacy online is protected and just as importantly our civil rights. And um, and we will see over and over that if we. Um, that if we, uh, you know, think about if 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 we think about the good, right, 
um, that can be done from like our targeting or our message development as, as, as equal to what big, powerful corporations are able to do with our data um, to, um, to continue to um, advance an economic agenda that will keep those at the bottom at the bottom and those at the top to have more and more. If we think about that as equal, then we are sort of really missing the point of, of where we're heading um, in, this, in this new age. And one of the things, go ahead, just oh, okay. I was just going to say, I mean, one of the ongoing discussions we always have at the ACLU is about data collection and protecting our rights, right? I mean, there are ec clear economic disparities, for example, in education. Mm -hmm. How how many kid, you know, kids who are pushed out of the, you know, schools and, mm -hmm. you know, they're because of, you know, uh, because of their race, but how many racial disparities there are in kids being pushed out of schools. And so we need that data. And, and it's not a question of spying on those kids. It's a question of spying on those schools, right, and making sure that those administrators are doing what they should be doing. So it's not, but by the same token, we've worked a lot of those things out too, right? I don't need to know the specific kid necessarily. I don't need to know if I'm looking at student test results, right? We want those posted online, at least in aggregate, so we know what schools are doing a good job and what schools are not doing a good job and, you know, some of the racial characteristics of those of the, the test results as well, but I don't need to know individual students. So there are ways that you can provide information, require data collection that also, you know, that don't in turn, you know, pro deal with some of the harmful sort of effects that we've had here. So I think that there are ways that we can do it that, uh, that make sense. I want to like raise a, since we're talking about like the benefits of big data, this isn't exactly a benefit, but I want to raise an uncomfortable question because I think it's uncomfortable, so maybe you guys will think it's interesting. Um, what do we do when the information, the big data analytic, is accurate but unfair? So here's the example, right? I'm Chicago police, right? I'm creating a heat list. I brought it up before. It's based on lots of characteristics, but let's say one of the main characteristics is who your friends are, right? So I can look at your, your Facebook page and say, well, if three of the people on, on your Facebook community have been shot, there is a better chance that you will be involved in violence than someone who's no one on their Facebook page has been involved in violence. Now, we're not saying it's a guarantee or even a likelihood, but it's more likely. It's more likely than someone else. Now, maybe that's an accurate result. Is it a fair one, though? Do we want police to be, or government in general, to be judging us based on our associations? Based on, like, who are, should I be worried about who my friends are? Because the government might attract more scrutiny to me. You know, th that analytic might be right, but is it fair? And I think that is a very difficult question that we have to grapple with because, again, some of the analytics that companies create will be accurate. They may know they can get me into Target with a $5 coupon. They might be able to get someone who has less money into me and into Target with a $1 coupon, and someone who's wealthier than me ha might take a whole $10 coupon. And because they know that because they know how much money I make. That's an accurate, you know, analytic. Is it a fair one? Do, are we worried that, like, suddenly the poorer consumer is getting even less economic benefit? They're getting the worst coupons? I mean, I think that somebody at that end of the spectrum would say, geez, I really would rather have everybody get a $5 coupon or even a $3 coupon than me be the one who gets the 50-cent coupon because they know how much money I make. So it's not all about accuracy. It's about... It's also about fairness and justice, and I think that that drew a lot of, that that kind of problem set drew a lot of us to this. I want to give uh, Jason the opportunity to jump in as well. And while Jason is um, talking, if you could if you could prepare yourself to ask questions <laughs> yourself, um, including those of you that are joining us by webcast, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, uh, talk a little bit on Chris's point, and then go back to your your initial question. But you Sorry. definitely you know <laughs> the it, it is a, a tough. <laughs> Tough question to ask. You know, I always ask this to everyone I talk to when I talk about these issues. You know, where do we draw the line uh, between something that's actually beneficial uh, versus something that actually, you know, could potentially harm, you know, communities that we represent? And 
thinking about this, you know, initially I always thought, you know, there's already things we can look at already that exist as a model of where, we, of where we want to make sure there are protections. So, you know, we have already laws on, you know, fair housing, fair lending, you know, uh, equal employment, uh, educational access. So I think that's a start of where we should be looking at where you know, this data uh, can be used for, for good or bad or both. Uh, and then going back to your initial question about Asian Americans, we, we are the first group to say that you know, data is great. Uh, you know, if, if you just say Asian, that doesn't really help our community when, you know, we come from, you know, we have ancestry, you know, 30 different countries and speak over 100 different languages and dialects. So, you know, like, for example, the Voting Rights Act, you know, if a certain jurisdiction has a certain amount of people who speak a certain language, they now have to, they now have, to have, you know, voting materials in that language. Uh, something like media diversity, where there's not a lot of Asians there and there's not a lot of uh, content that's, you know, linguistically or culturally, culturally relevant for us. Maybe it is good for a cable company or whoever to, you know, have data on, you know, what type of Asian are you, what is your ethnicity, what language do you speak, so that we could actually have content that's actually good for us. So, you know, we were the first to, to be out there and say, you know, data can be good, uh, you know, s some practices are okay, although there do need to be protections. So, you know, I think there is there, there's a, it's a balance that we have to strike. Jump in there. I'm going to challenge you on being the first to say the data. <laughs> I mean, I do believe that um, they use social data, right, in Brown v. Board of Education. So I think the data has always been amazing, um, and we love data. I mean, data is what companies use right now to make sure that they, ha that they meet their diversity numbers that they say they're going to meet for employers. Data, I was talking to a company recently, data is what helped their collection of data on their hiring process and the interview process and how they analyzed that was showed them the difference between who they hired and why there was a difference between their pool of applicants and who they hired and they were able to change that looking in that data. That's amazing stuff. Data where I think if you look on the employment side, data can be great. If you look on the consumer side, data can be great. But going to what Chris said about the fairness and how do you really align fairness um, with with um, the data that can be collected, I think it's a lot easier, I would say this, Chris, I think it's a lot easier on the consumer side and even on the employment side to make that delineation. But on the government surveillance side, I think it's a lot harder. I mean, I remember exactly where I was on 9-11. I, when we find out, I w it was nine, it's like 9.03. My civil, my Civ Pro class had just started at Howard Law um, and we did not know what happened. Um, and we were told, the police came, and part police came and told us we had to leave. And you had to go somewhere. We tried to get to the metro, the metro was closed. By the time I got to a TV about um, almost nearly an hour later, I was just in time to see the first tower collapse. And I just remember that feeling that I had. So uh, that, wow, I hope that people got out. But knowing, I mean, I can feel myself tearing up about it now, because knowing that everybody could not have possibly have gotten out of that building. So I think, and I think that's where we are in our society right now. We, on the gov from the government side, you remember, I think most Americans remember that feeling that you had. You know what their, you know what their aim is, and you just, it's just not, you can't, it's not as easy to say that you just have to stop it or that you shouldn't have that information, right? So um, I completely agree with things like ECPA, right? Mm -hmm. Where we need, we need to change um, we need. We, it's been a long time since the '80s since we um, since they've had any sort of legislation that actually protects like email communication or any sort of electronic communication. Right. I'm looking forward to see what the Supreme Court says on Riley and on Worry because I don't think that you should be able to search somebody's cell phone. Right. I don't know if you guys know those are two Supreme Court cases that are up right now for review about whether or not um, it, incident to a lawful arrest, the police can search your cell phone and your smartphone. I know how much information I have on my smartphone. I definitely wouldn't want the police to, I don't think I do anything illegal, but I still don't want them to, something. exactly, but I don't want them to have have that information. And does is that what was intended with the Fourth Amendment? Like, should they be able to do that? Because in 1970s, when they when they said that, yes, they could, they, they thought about things that were actually harmful to a police officer. Is a cell phone harmful to a police officer? So we'll see. So, I mean, I think, I, but I think when you come when you come down to that and even looking at those issues, those are some really difficult legal issues because they have such large implications for, um, I think, the safety in our community and the safety that we all want as Americans. It's a great, can I just 
Okay, and, and then I really want to open it up to the audience because we're a packed uh, house. And since you pointed it, um, <laughs> <laughs> this brings it really. It's a it's a really good point, and it's it I think raises something that many Americans intuitively feel because they they want the government to protect them, and it raises something we haven't talked a lot about yet, which is the fact that there's a fair amount of analytics floating around at this point that don't work. And so there's a real sort of snake oil problem that I think we need to look at here, and it's particularly pernicious on the government side. I mean, there's a data mining report that goes all the way back to like 2008, all the way back to 2008. Oh, yeah. I know, but you know, basically that said data mining has no predictive value for finding terrorists. It's just terrorism is too small and varied a thing to be pulled out by big data analytics. Similarly, in the looking at the NSA scandals, we saw the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board mm -hmm. and the President's hand-picked advisory board both say that this 215 NSA phone records program, where we're getting everybody's phone records, has not actually saw, helped in solving any terrorist crimes. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of a, you know, there is a safety issue, but there's, a, but there's also a, you know, before we get into the privacy questions, you know, we should be using tools that work. And then we can decide whether we need to balance privacy and, and safety. So I had to get my pitch in there. See that? <laughs> so I want to open it up to the flow. Oh, Hazine wants to try. I, I, can I get a show of hands of those of you that want to ask questions? Great. Okay. Yeah, you guys can go. <laughs> so, because my question to him is going to be like, but how do you know what's working when you don't even truly know we sit around the entire we, realm? We talk about these issues talking. all the time, all the time. So. But go on. So, uh, I just had to. I had to. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, good morning. Thank you all for being here. Um, I, I wanted to kind of bring it back to um, the point that Chris was mentioning earlier about using, um, kind of using the, all the data that we have um, to and, and make the best use of it. And um, in my experience, I've seen you know a lot of federal, state governments um, not collect the right data, and so I was wondering what insight you all have about um, promoting more accountability and transparency around um, you know really collecting the right data that that we need. I mean, I think the I think the principles in general are meant to encourage government and private entities, right? Um, to develop and use data in a way that promotes exactly what you asked, like in a way that promotes equal opportunity and equal justice. I think that we have not, they're pretty general right now because we, um, we're still working on more research about the trans, um, behind the opaqueness of the data that's being collected on both sides. So I think when we get to that, we'll have, um, we hope to have eventually, right, um, to have deeper um, recommendations but I think because it's such an opaque process it's kind of hard to say exactly what we want to do I do know that we all support ECPA um, uh, and that's a well, you and I do I yeah, think they do yeah. I think, well, <laughs> we, we support ECPA <laughs> on the government side so and protecting like electronic communications and making sure at least that the privacy laws that we do have um, do take into into account the technological advances that have happened hey, I, just as I, you know we from our experience you know I think before 2000, you know, Asian, Asian like in the, in the census categories, it was Asian American, and then before that, it was like yellow, you know, <laughs> or, or like Oriental, something like that. So, you know, we definitely have a lot of experience of just educating, at least on the government side, the need for the right kind of data. You know, if you if you're just doing Asian, for example, and you're not collecting the, the ethnicity, you're not really doing a service to a lot of communities that have very specific health problems or, you know, that have the highest rate of poverty out of any yeah. racial or ethnic category, uh, like within the, Hmong, well, within the Hmong community, for example. So, again, at least on the government side, there's, there's a lot of advocacy groups that push to have that data disaggregated. Uh, on the corporate side, though, you know, it's, 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 it's a different story. I mean, they're also collecting data. For them, for us, it's been about uh, sh showing why it makes business sense to collect the right kind of data. Again, if you uh, if you're collecting data and it's not going to make you money, you know that just it just doesn't make sense for a company or anyone trying to make money to do it. So again, we teach them, you know, why it's important and it makes money for them to have the right kind of data. We had a question up in the front here. Hi. Um, 
I guess this question is sort of responding to something Hazine said in particular, but the whole panel, it's really for the whole panel. Um, you had talked about, the, well, partially about uh, um, opacity of the data, mm -hmm. and you wanted to, you were talking about a transparency principle, wanting to know they collected that you work at the National Urban League and that you read historical romance novels, mm -hmm. and what does that mean about you? I think there's a problem in that the data brokers don't know what that means about you because the whole process is done by machine learning. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious if you thought about what a transparency principle would even look like because seeing that they collected those raw data will not in any way tell you how, it'll be, how it's being used. How, how would we find that out? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, you, I'm sure you have uh, some ideas, but I mean, I think the fact is that I agree, but I think there, there. I think that's a good question, but in some ways, it's sort of an edge question because there's. First of all, we're not getting anywhere near all the data points. I mean, mm -hmm. Axiom says they have something like 1,500 data points. Uh, trust me, the, I looked at my tra Axiom transparency report. It did not give me 1,500 data points. Um, and, and then there's a second tier of sort of value opinions about me. Now they may not be able to give you every evaluative judgment. But they could tell me, for example, what lists I'm on, who's been, yeah. what's been, what I've been sold to in the last month, like how many companies, how was I categorized, stuff like that is, you know, or, you know, the types of ads I'm being served, you know, whether they are sharing it with a third party company that's using it to inform the ads that I'm seeing. You know, there, there is a huge amount of transparency that could happen at the, you know, beyond that. And I agree with Chris. I think it's uh, it's not just um, it's not just getting finding out what they have what they've ascribed to me and what it says because obviously I don't think that those two that I mean those are just two random examples right those two things really say a lot about me right I think it, anyone can have that but I think that until we kind of start getting to see all the data points and especially who they're selling the information to it be in, it's important right that's when we that's when we can really kind of delve down and really get a little bit more nuanced about our recommendations and what kind and know exactly what more transparency we need. Like, um, for instance, there was, so there was this one, this, this thing sticks out of my mind a lot because I'm at Urban League and we talk about jobs, right? And, you know, African Americans' um, job numbers have been extremely low um, for a long time. So I think a couple, maybe about a month ago or two, there was an article, uh, there a couple articles written, I think one in the New York Times, about ways in which the uh, new empl employers are using, um, predictive analytics to decide whether or not somebody can work. Uh, somebody will, uh, will manage to work, uh, work there successfully. So my problem with that, and, but, and I don't know what questions are being asked, but I did know that it said I, what I would want us to dwell a little bit deeper into it was because they were asking people how long, one of the questions they had was, how long does it take you to get to work? What sort of transportation do you take to get to work, right? So last year, the Brookings Institute did a whole piece on transportation and jobs and how jobs are uh, job sprawl is leaving the urban uh, leaving urban areas and the center business districts, right? So if you're a low income person and you live in an urban area, but jobs now are located um, uh, in a lot of our urban areas like Chicago, Atlanta. I know the Chicago and Atlanta were over sixty something percent of their jobs were less were ten to thirty five miles away from their from the center business district, right? Detroit, that just that everybody knows they filed bankruptcy. They're like they're the highest with seventy seven percent, right? So if, with a large population of African Americans in this sit in this area, knowing that that's a question that came up, I would love for us to get more transparency about that because if I know that my people. Um, are, and the communities that we serve don't have access to great transportation services, um, will, are likely having to travel 90 minutes or more even to their jobs, and to know that this is a question that, is, that could potentially keep them from getting a job, that's something that's in, that, that is of interest to me. So I, I mean, I, didn't, I say all that to say that I don't know exactly what transparency we need. I just know that we need it, and as we get more information, that's when we're, we're, um, we will be able to really dig down a little bit deeper to say this is, this is, all, this is what we need. Uh, and I think it's going to be an ongoing process. Rashad, I know you have something to say about this, especially since your organization has been involved in doing research on um, corporate co co collection of data of consumers. 
Yes, we actually do, and I actually raised my hand actually to address a point that I've been sort of stewing on and trying to figure out the right way to say it. Because <laughs> you um, you brought up a point, and I know, I know you may not have meant it this way, Hazine, but I, mm -hmm. I do want us to not leave this room um, with that 9-11 moment. Um, and as an example of why it's okay um, in this new era, because the, the I didn't the, say it was okay. I know, I, I, know, I, know, I, know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. And this, so I'm and sure. then I, I, I know, never I know. said it was okay. I know, but, but, but <laughs> I don't want to see that on Twitter. I did not say it was okay. <laughs> not write that down. Yes, <laughs> but say that. But 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 hard balance. Right. But hard balance, right? Hard balance does mean that there that 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 we that when the seesaw moves. It becomes okay at times, and 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 that's and that's I guess what I just want to say because because whether it's 9/11, whether it's police surveillance in inner cities, whether it's um, whether it's these sort of issues where um, certain communities become the target, where oppressed communities become we put are put in harm's way by powerful forces and don't then have a voice to sort of stand up and push back, and I and I know. And I, I know exactly what you're saying, and I and I and I and I and I, and that's why I struggled with even bringing it up. Um, but I do know that when we have these conversations on hard balance, the seesaw always tilts towards putting oppressed communities in harm's way, and 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 at the expense of of these ideas of of safety, which oftentimes don't ever pan out, and and um, and protection and security. Um, for for community for for folks in Nebraska that are worried about 9/11 um, happening, um, you know these, you know these are sort of the the ways the ways in which these discussions oftentimes get get railroaded off of how do we ensure our civil rights protections are secure. It's also the easy way for us to put aside our civil rights and our human rights in times. Of, of stress and challenge in this country, which are the times where we need to sort of elevate and advance our civil rights and human rights because it makes us who we are as a people. Right, those, those questions, those, those hard questions, are exactly the questions that people should be asking, mm -hmm. and that's why we have the principles. We wanna be part mm -hmm. of this conversation. Yes. And, and that's all we're saying. So we may not have the answers. Well, it's one of the things we're saying. We're more than saying more than that. Yeah. Well, we're okay. definitely we're yeah. definitely saying we're that. definitely saying. We're that. Well, also one of the things that I think I'm hearing is that, and this comes back to a point that Green was raising earlier. This is a conversation that we want to have with everyone. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. These are issues that really affect everyone. So the question about transparency is a very difficult one to tease apart, especially when you start getting down to the nitty gritty details. But we need to have that conversation in the context of thinking about discrimination, in the context of thinking about fairness. And I'm going to ask Kirsten to please, um, if you could go to the back. We have <laughs> a question all the way into the back. Chris, were you going to respond quickly? No. Uh, no. OK. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I have a couple questions. Uh, first, I wanted to know if any of you think that there's any possibility for legislative action as far as dragnet surveillance goes, as the prison programs and the justification between telephone uh, kind of uh, monitoring programs. And at the, sa at the same time, you know, ever since um, the Obama administration came in, during the Bush administration, the Democrats were heavily critical of those programs of kind of warrantless wiretapping. But Obama came in and kind of normalized the process. You know, and kind of removed it from the political debate. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there is any potential that you guys see for progress there. And then also I'd like to know if there is any potential uh, judicially following the two federal judges that struck uh, that justification down and what the kind of track record and timetable for that is. Thanks. Are those in my wheelhouse? That's yes. yeah. definitely um, Chris' question. <laughs> so take them in no particular order, because I'm not sure I remember the order. Uh, I think that there is a, a real possibility of legislative change on the on the 215 program, if for no other reason that there are sunsets on some of those programs. So Congress is going to have to address them. I mean, I suppose they could do a blanket reauthorization, as they have in the past. I think that seems less likely, given the disclosures of the last nine months. Um, so as to what that will look like, I think w we don't know. The USA Freedom Act is certainly the ACLU's believe that's the appropriate way to end the 215 program and continue to, to safeguard our both our privacy and our civil liberties. In terms of court action, um, 
we have a lawsuit, so I better say that there's a, a, a realistic possibility of overstanding things in the courts, or I will be in a lot of trouble. Um, but I do think that there is. Uh, obviously, we've already seen one federal judge agree with us, one federal judge disagree. Um, so you know, I think that's a, that that's at least a puncher's chance, right? Um, and I think we're, we'll eventually hear it from the court one way or another. Um, in terms of normalizing things, I, I agree with your point. It, it's really unfortunate how many programs have continued under the Obama administration. I mean, it's it's not just warrantless wiretapping. It's drone drone assassination. It's um, you know, Guantanamo is not closed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there there are really there are huge nine, post 9/11 issues that remain unresolved. Um, that you know, the both parties now have have to will will have to deal with the legacy of for many years. So, I, I am a strong believer in both the pendulum swinging back and forth, and if I can mix my metaphors, the arch, the arch of history, the arc of history. I believe that these. Some of these programs, all of these programs, are fundamentally undemocratic. They are fundamentally unfair, and they're wrong. And I, I think that the American public and American society will come to embrace that view, and, uh, and we will see an end to, to many of the worst of these practices. I want to translate um, a question that has come through the Twitter feed. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a question about young people. So this is a question as much for Rashad. Uh, it's for everyone, but I know that um, Color of Change has a uh, uh, very young and engaged membership. Um, and you can like call me a young person anytime. <laughs> <laughs> it's not yeah, happening yeah. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question is, or the statement was, I'm pretty sure that data, uh, that young people today don't care about data brokers. And I'm wondering the extent to which that's true um, in your local chapters and, or in your younger membership. Um, how are young communities of color thinking about these issues? Um, young people, young, young people care if they're being um, unfairly targeted by the police through programs like Stop and Frisk. They care if they're being if there's surveillance issues happening in their communities that are sort of targeting them unfairly or 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 you know um, increasing sort of issues around school to prison pipeline or other issues. Um, you know these issues around third party brokers are are, are new issues, um, and we also you know, have an age where millennials and, and younger generations have grown up in an internet age where they're used to, to signing up for Gmail or not even email anymore, but, but and, and having ads that are targeted towards them. Um, and, and, and that's just been the frontier in terms of how people have sort of experienced the internet and have experienced technology that, that the idea of everything from applications that, you know, you put on your phone and even when you delete them, they'd actually never really go away. Um, the idea of saying what you want to say on Twitter or sending what you want to send on Snapchat. The ideas of sort of holding back information is, 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 is different. Um, for this generation, but the concepts of how people should be treated, um, the, 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 the principles of fairness, the principles of being able to sort of roam freely and, ha and, and make your voice heard, this generation um, of not being judged by sort of characteristics of how you were born, this generation is much more open than other generations. Mm -hmm. And so the, the idea of, of the impact that these third party brokers could have on sort of fundamental principles that this, that millennials and the generations that are sort of after them sort of have, believe, and live, you know, this is the work of organizations like all of ours up here to sort of translate these issues and give people something impactful to do. But the idea to, of saying that that the next generation does not care about like their their rights to be able to like move freely in our in our country and be heard and be treated with with equality. Um, you know, is is not true. And and the fact that this generation like generations before them, will stand up to forces um, that um, put um, their fundamental, that sort of violate their fundamental values and beliefs. 
Jason, yeah. you wanted to add something? Yeah, one thing that is cool that we've done as a coalition is, you know, we've actually done polling and I've, we've sat behind the one-way mirror and talked to, and listened to people talk about these issues. And the things that I took away from them were like, you know, there is, people know it's happening, but they don't know, you know, the, the, the level of it and mm -hmm. what exactly they're doing. But the other part is, you know, there is a lot of apathy or there's just helplessness that they feel. They know it's happening, but there's nothing they can really do about it. So, you know, I'm really f looking forward to having these principles to, you know, for me, you know, especially just go into my community and say, hey, let's have a talk. Let's see exactly what, what you know, what you don't know, and let me educate you and see where we all come out, how we come out on this. Yeah, and I, was, and I would say because of those, because of the polling and the focus groups that we've done, it's exactly the reason why I think that, that we need to continue to educate our communities because it's that feeling, going back, once again, I did not say <laughs> that it's ever okay to use surveillance against like oppressed communities. Um, I wanna make sure, this, this is something that I we found. I didn't see it on the Twitter feed, okay, by the way. I just wanna make sure, but I also wanna say, but this is, this, was, this is one of the things, like when we did it, we looked at it, and we, in our focus groups, we didn't do them by race, and we had people of different incomes, and we knew and so you could watch and you could hear what people were saying. And the thing is that even though you know it's being used against your community, there is still that extreme tension because we just don't have enough information about what's going on on the government side. So until we get that information, you can't really break people's feelings. And so, I mean, because you need <laughs> data to break to help people understand that their emotion the emotions that they have connected to 911 isn't exactly translating to what's being gathered on them but until until you have that until you can educate them because we've received transparency and then we can do our jobs as the community as communities who work to empower our communities of color um, that we can't i think I, it's just it's it's hard we have a question up in the front, and then I see somebody with a purple sweater back there. Um, and if you could start thinking, I think we're, what time do we wrap up? 10.30. So if there's a burning question that you think has to be answered, that this panel can't leave this stage without answering, please. And we'll try to answer faster. They're all burning. We'll, yeah. will be quick. <laughs> Hello. Um, okay. I, I saw two things. One was a TED Talk by Ellie Pariser called The Filter Bubble, and another is a documentary called Terms and Conditions May Apply. And, it, and this relates to the way in which, my question relates to um, the way in which I receive information, how it looks different for me and, and, and than it does for, for other people. And um, I, I, I'm sorry, pardon my ignorance, but this is Facebook and Google, are they third party that are uh, are they the ones that are interpreting what I see, or who, who is? Yeah. That, that's a tricky question. Yeah. Um, th there, Google is both a first and a third party. Mm -hmm. They are both an advertiser that collects a lot of information from other people. They are also collecting a tremendous amount of information about you, um, obviously, as a first party. So they, say, so they are making judgments, but again, it's difficult to know. Google has, has some transparency tools that allow you to know more, for example, than a data broker certainly will tell you about yourself. Mm -hmm. But it's not clear yet how exactly how much information is out there. So yeah. is that And I wouldn't call them a data broker because yes. they don't they don't sell data. So they're not they're not um, I guess the they're not one of the companies that collect the data and sell them and give that data out. They might collect it from other people, they might get it mm. from other companies, but from what I understand they do not sell data. We can talk about that. Anyway. <laughs> so, do you want to pose your question, and then I'm going to ask our gentleman in the purple sweater to also pose his question because we're okay, just, running out of just time. Just the one thing about like yep. a, 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 like a ghostery type add-on uh, to to an application. What what does that does that do anything? Um, well, it certainly will prevent you from seeing ads. I, I think it would prevent uh, some third-party collection. I, I don't know that it would protect all third-party collection. It's, I don't think it would do anything about first-party collection. First, there first party, something? yes, yeah. So partly, it, as the person that works with the organization called the Open Technology Institute, I'll just say very briefly that it, it alerts people as to the type of tracking that's happening. Um, and it's mm -hmm. one tool in the toolbox that I think is available to us as consumers and citizens to understand how tracking is happening and what we might do about it. I think what our panelists are, are talking about, though, is that there's more to it than that. Mm -hmm. There are you know, right. ways of engaging communities, ways of our civil rights um, organizations engaging with communities to help grow awareness and um, 
talk about these issues to a greater extent. So it's one tool in the toolbox. And our gentleman in the purple sweater. Glad I wore this purple sweater. <laughs> um, thank you for taking my question. I want to share a quote I heard, which is pretty great. It doesn't, credit does not go to me. It goes to Dan Arley, who's a professor at Duke. He said, big data is like teenage sex. Everyone is talking about it. Nobody knows what they're doing, but everyone thinks everyone's doing it, so everybody claims that they're doing it. <laughs> um, and I feel like that's fairly accurate because the conversation is not very deep on the side of, I think people who follow big data know, get that joke. Um, it's not very sophisticated. One of the questions I had for you is um, about data scientists, and I was curious to find that there, you know, there's not a data scientist on the panel. I think that's an important perspective because as algorithms become the gatekeepers, in a sense, in, in making those decisions, I don't think any of them would argue that there's assumptions that they're making. So I guess my question for the panel is, how are you getting that conversation going with the other side of the house, the data scientists? Um, and very quickly, two, two resources I think haven't been mentioned, which I think are important. One is the Council for Big Data Ethics and Society in New York. I don't know if you know about this, but the Data and Society Research Institute is a very solid new initiative. And the other is a paper that just came out from Washington College of Law called Big Data Ethics. And um, very good piece on like laying out the principles. So if people haven't seen those, I'd encourage checking them out. Thanks. Well, I'll just say very quickly, great question. Um, I think th this, in many ways, is an invitation to have that discussion. Um, and, si and since we've, I, I will certainly say, just speaking for myself, since we, the, the principles came out, I've heard from quite a few people. We, I mean, we've been involved in an ongoing discussion with the broader privacy community um, about these questions and about these principles. So I, I think the short answer is we are very much aware that, that there is an enormous amount of complexity. And I think we surfaced some of it here. Um, and then, and we will, our hope is that these principles will be part of educating, helping us to sort of educate each other, our communities, about what the best practices are, what the tools are, so that you can evaluate, for example, a good algorithm from a snake oil. You know, and, 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 and then we can decide whether, even if it's a good algorithm, whether we think it's the right algorithm or fair. Mm -hmm. I'll just say briefly, and I think this might be a, a nice way to wrap up, is that the conversations that we're starting here are conversations that are going to travel far and wide um, over the next year, over the next few years. Um, as Kevin mentioned um, at the beginning of this event, uh, some of us will be participating in the White House's comprehensive review of big data, where we anticipate these questions of discrimination and fairness will come to the fore. So we're beginning to have those conversations with the data scientists, with some of the legal scholars like Deirdre Mulligan, Cynthia Dwork, um, Neil Richards, um, Kate Crawford, those kinds of individuals that have uh, initiated some really good thinking about these issues and putting that directly in conversation with the experiences and the stories and the history that all of these civil rights and human rights organizations are familiar with and deeply engaged with. And that's the kind of conversation that we look forward to moving ahead. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>